Well, are you ready to finish up our Armor Up series? This side is. Let me ask this side over here. Are you ready to finish up our Armor Up, Armor up series? I almost said Armor All series. <laughs> no, not Armor All, not Under Armor. Armor Up. <laughs> So um, if, if, you, if you have your Bible, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 6. I want to just read our, our text, and I'm going to give a little running commentary as we do, uh, leading up to today's pieces of armor, because we're going to be finishing that up today. Paul starts in verse 10 and 11. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now remember that Paul is admonishing us to put on superhuman strength. The word here is, is, would have been used by Homer for demigods, for, for supernatural human ability that goes beyond natural human ability. So he's saying, become superhuman. How? By putting on the whole armor of God, not part of it, all of it every piece of it, that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the strategies, the trickery, the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Can I get an amen? amen. Remember, we're not fighting people. Turn to your neighbor and say, I ain't fighting you. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I ain't fighting you. I'm not fighting with you, I'm fighting for you. Come on, somebody. We're all fighting for one another. So we're not fighting flesh and blood, but, it, but principalities, that's first things, against powers and rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. If you weren't here that week, you ought to get that because there's lots of information in there that reading that in English you miss. Therefore, take up the whole armor. <laughs> it's like Paul saying, hey, Jack, just in case you weren't listening, get it all. Pick up the whole thing. In case you weren't paying attention to what I just wrote, put the whole thing on, every piece of it. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day, verse 13, and having done all to stand, when you think you've stood all you can stand, stand some more. Stand therefore having, and instead of continuing to read, let's just do a very quick review. Because I realize we have new folks with us that haven't been here, people that maybe missed a Sunday and didn't watch online. So, so I'm not going to re-preach it, but I just, as we're finishing, I want us to remember what we're putting on. Number one, the belt of truth or the loin belt. This protects your vulnerable places. <laughs> If you didn't hear that message, you have never heard a belt preach like I preached it that Sunday. I promise you, I talked about things your mama didn't talk about in church. At least my mama didn't talk about in church. Also, everything basically hangs on this belt. It's the foundational garment. It's the foundation that all the rest of the armor Hangs on. Then number two, the breastplate of righteousness, which covers the vital organs, especially the heart. And it's his righteousness, not our righteousness. Come on, it's him, not me. Right? Then number three, the, the, the shoes of peace. Remember Roman, soldier, Roman soldiers' shoes. That's hard to say very fast. I'm trying to hurry. Roman soldier shoes had two parts. They had the greave, which protected the legs. It kept the enemy from being able to break your legs easy, from being able to knock your legs out from under you. You ever felt like the devil tried to knock your legs out from under you? I have. And then the shoes itself, which were, had spikes on them, as you can see there, for treading on the enemy. And when those guys started doing this, they were declaring that we're together, conquering, taking territory, overcoming the enemy. And then, of course, the shield of faith, which we had, if you are watching this not live, but online after live, you might have missed that, that they just presented our vision team with exact replica shields of faith of the pictures that we had used earlier. 
But we also learn that our faith is not designed to be used individually, but corporately. And you can see in this photo here that when you link them together, like when we were standing up here with our shields a moment ago, uh, linked together, that the enemy cannot penetrate you. Last week then, Dr. Cato talked to us about the fifth piece of armor, which is this helmet of salvation. This helmet is beautiful to behold. You know, it's a beautiful sight when God's salvation is working out in your life. When people see how God has saved you, how he's delivered you, how he's transformed you, it's beautiful for everybody to see. It also covered your, their mind. It was very ornate on purpose to be put on display, but, but it, cover, it had a very practical purpose, and that was to cover the mind. So the blows of the enemy couldn't get in. And how many of you know that the devil wants to attack your mind? He wants to accuse you and lie to you. Salvation is being born again, but it's so much more than that. Actually, in the Greek, it literally means to be brought to a safe place. So the helmet of salvation takes you to your safe place. I ain't got time. Ain't nobody got time for that. Now, come on. But I'm telling you, that's good stuff. God wants you to go to your safe place every day. He wants you to walk in salvation every day, which leads me to the last half of verse 17, which is where we find the sixth piece of armor, which is the sword of the Spirit. He said, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. That's number six. The first thing to note today about the, a Roman soldier's sword is that, again, like much of the rest of the armor, it hung on his Belt. You can see this photo that we have here. He has two swords, uh, basically a dagger and then a regular sword. Many Roman soldiers wore them both. What does that remind us? That the word of God, whether written or spoken, whether we're talking about the whole Bible or a prophetic word, or any word, but let's specifically talk about prophecy. When you, how many of you have ever gotten a prophetic word from God over your life? Raise your hand if you've ever gotten a word from God. Well, when God speaks to you, that word has to be hung on truth. It has to be hung on this word. Any word from God has to be hung on truth, and truth is a person, and his name is Jesus, and you've got to hang your prophecy on Jesus because there's no word greater than him. If you go to the, the next photo, you can see that this is a little bit pi different picture. You can see it out of its she, uh, case, sheet. Over time in, in Rome, because Rome, the Roman army ruled for many, many years, and over time there were different types of swords used for different purposes. One sword was uh, a gladius sword. It would have been uh, s several feet tall, could have been up to five or six feet. It would have been the, like an old English broadsword. It was known as a two-handed sword. It would have been the kind of sword that William Wallace used. Thank you, Chris. Come on, freedom. Somebody yell Freedom. Thank you. Makes me feel better. But this sword would have been sharp on one side and dull on the other side. It was a one-edged sword. Then over time, those began to be hard to carry because you couldn't wield your sword and carry your shield and do all the things you had to do. So they began to shorten them to about 17 to 19 inches, probably similar to this sword here. They also then created a sword for the infantry that was thinner and longer and it was more like you would have seen the cavalry in, in, in old west days or, or uh, uh, in fencing, a fencing sword. But then finally you came to the word that Paul used which is uh, machara, machara. It's a, and, and it literally means a short sword or a dagger. 
So it could have been, this word was used interchangeably for these 17 to 19 inch swords that were sharp on both sides or both edges. Many soldiers, as I said, would carry both. One for a little bit uh, for use when they were fighting, hand-to-hand combat. But the dagger, when you got really close, could be the last thing that finished the enemy off. The points were shorter and lighter than the big two-handed sword, making it easier to carry around with you and easier to fight with. If you study ancient Roman literature, there were many writings about them. One uh, ancient Roman writer talked about this machera and how that sometimes it was curved on the end and that, they th- that many times it was believed that you had to thrust it way into the enemy, but actually a two-inch incision, if you will, in the right place was lethal. And because of the way, it w- the ones that were curved at the end, you put it in, twist it, and it's a lethal blow. I don't want to get too graphic. Actually, I do because I love this stuff. Just full disclosure, I want to really get into that, but your imagination can take you there. Why is this important to understand all these different types of swords? Well, in Greek, there are two words for the word. So when, when he says the sword of the spirit, so he's not talking about a natural sword, he's talking about a spiritual sword, which is the word of God. What is he talking about? First of all, the word of God can be either logos or rhema. Logos or rhema. Now, I don't have time to unpack these two words in their entirety, but let me give you some headlines about them. The most common understanding of logos and rhema is that logos is the written word, rhema is the spoken word. And although that's true, it's an oversimplification. So you could say that logos is this, and you could say that rhema is when this comes alive and it's spoken directly to you. Have you ever been reading your Bible and all of a sudden something jumped out of the page and you just said, I've never seen that before, even though you've read it a million times? That's logos becoming rhema. Another way of looking at it is is logos is the totality of what God has said, whereas rhema is a specific word or a word within the word. It's a chapter within a book, a paragraph within a chapter, a sentence within a paragraph, a word within a sentence. I think you get the idea. Or you could say that Logos is the word of God. As I said a moment ago, Rhema is a word from God. So which one is Paul using here in Ephesians 6? Rhema. Now, Ephesians 6 is not the only place that the word is compared to a sword. If you look at John's revelation uh, on the, of Jesus on the Isle of Patmos, which that's what this was. You understand the book of Revelation is not an eschatological book. Some of you, that just blew your mind. But anyway, it is an apocryphal book, but not the way we think. It's poetic literature. It's very similar to other writings of the day that were known as apocryphal, not apocalyptic, or apocalyptic, excuse me. It's not apocalyptic in the sense of of a, a, a crash of the end times. It's apocalyptic in that it's cryptic, it's symbolic, and it is it is designed to be poetic. But in its essence, Paul uh, John tells us how to interpret Revelation when he says that this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. So right in the beginning, here's what he says in Revelation 1.16. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went what? A sharp, two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So Jesus has out of his mouth, he's holding stars in his right hand, and out of his mouth comes a double-edged or a two-edged sword. What is a two-edged sword? Well, I'm glad you ask. In Greek, it's distomos, which means 
two-edged. That's not hard to figure out. But also, it's a confusing word. Because if you go back to its roots, the original root for this word, distemos, is two-mouthed. Some of you, that already hit you. Some of you, it's about to hit you. Some of you will hit you on Tuesday. <laughs> How is the word of God two-mouthed? So you could literally say that Jesus had stars in his right hand and he had a two-mouthed sword coming out of his mouth. How does the word of God have two mouths? Well, the first mouth is when God speaks it. But the second mouth is when I speak it. No, 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 no. Let me try that again. I said, I said the first mouth, the first edge is when God speaks it, but the second edge is when I speak it because God's word in my mouth becomes a powerful weapon. See, you think if God said it, then that's enough. No, baby, let me tell you, God said it, and he's waiting for somebody on the earth to stand up, pull their sword, and speak out of their mouth what God said. John got a revelation that Jesus was our example. He put the word in his mouth to defeat the enemy. Some of you go, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> go to, and we're not going to go there, but if you were to go study this week, Mark chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1, it tells the story of Jesus' temptation. Come here, Cody. Come here, come here, come here. Stand right down here. So, so the de- Jesus in the wilderness, fasting and praying, 40 days. How many of you think you'd be hungry after 40 days? So the devil comes to him. You get to be the devil. No comment. And, and, and his mama says he's an angel. No comment. No, I'm just kidding. He really is. He is. I'm just kidding. So, so the devil comes and says, now remember, here's the context. Jesus is at baptism. And the father says, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So who said Jesus was the son of God? The father. Right? Did Jesus say it? Who said it? The father. So the devil comes immediately. So Jesus gets a prophecy. He gets a word. He gets a rhema. Everybody say rhema. And the rhema says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He hadn't done nothing. He ain't healed the sick. He ain't raised the dead. He ain't cast out no devils. It's my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now watch this. The devil comes immediately in the wilderness after 40 days of being hungry and he says, if you be who God says you are, if you be the son of God, if you are, not who you say you are, but if you are who God says you are, then turn this stone into bread. Provide for yourself. Now, how many times have you been in the wilderness? I doubt many of us have fasted 40 days. I have not. My hand goes up in the crowd of not having fasted 40 days. I fast four hours, and I feel like my throat has been cut. I have fasted three days and thought I was going to die. Can I get a witness? So if you can imagine, you're at a vulnerable place, you're weak, you get a prophetic word, you go to try to live for God, and immediately the devil, that dirty, stinking, ugly, hairy devil comes and says, if you are who God says you are, then do the stuff. And how many times have we gone, wow, huh, maybe. 
maybe I should. That's logical. If I am, then I should be able to. Let's try it. Hocus pocus. But what did Jesus do? He pulled out his sword and said what? It is written. Come on, say it with me. It is written. Where was it written? In the word. So he, ah! It's written that man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So what is he saying? He's saying, devil, listen, God said that I'm his son. You didn't say it. I didn't say it. You can't stop it, and I don't have to prove it because the Bible says that I can live by every word that comes out of the mouth of my God, and my God has said it. That settles it, and devil, you are a liar. I ain't through with you, devil. Come back up here. <laughs> then the devil gets a bright idea. He decides he'll get a sword. I need another Bible. I need another. This is a bigger Bible. I like this. It's a big Bible. I got my gladius sword right here. And so the devil then says, if you be the son of God, takes him up to a pinnacle, pinnacle of the temple. He says, uh, throw yourself down because it is written. Huh? Yeah. The devil just pulled out his own sword. Do you know the devil knows the Bible? He actually knows it better than most Christians. Right. I'm smiling. My wife says smile when you say difficult things because it's like <laughs> sugar with the spinach. Anyway, so he says, it is written that he'll give his angels charge over you. So Jesus, if you are who you say you are, jump off here and angels will save you. But see, listen, the devil had a sword, but he didn't know how to use it. So Jesus says, well, devil, it is also written that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So take that, you sorry devil. So Jesus and the devil are having a sword fight. But guess who's going to win every time? She's going to get, get out of here. Go. Now his mama can help him. Come on, give Cody a big hand. He did well there. See, if you're going to get in a sword fight with the devil, you need to know the word better than the devil knows the word. You better know what you're saying more than the devil knows what he's saying. You got to understand not only that you have a sword, but you got to know how to use that sword and be skillful with the word of God. And when the devil comes and says, you can't do it, you're never going to make it, it's never going to work for you, you pull out your sword and you say, I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I can do what God says I can do. I can have what God says I can have. I can be what God says I can be. I'm an overcomer in Christ Jesus. I'm more than a conqueror. <laughs> Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any Two-edged sword. Piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit and joint and marrow. And as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So Jesus began with a sword in his mouth. He came to earth learning how to say what God said. And you've got to learn how to put God's word in your mouth. And it becomes a powerful weapon. And it will divide soul and spirit. It'll divide thoughts and intents. It's a discerner. God's word 
in his mouth is a one-edged sword. But God's word in your mouth makes it a two-edged sword. God's word in your mouth is a dagger in the spirit. So speak the word and you're cutting the devil to pieces. Then there was a final piece of armor in a Roman soldier's repertoire. It's not specifically mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6, and most theologians would acknowledge, matter of fact, I don't think I've ever read one that wouldn't acknowledge there's a seventh piece of armor. It was very well known. Paul specifically seems to or appears to mention six. So as you can imagine, there's been a lot of debate amongst theologians as to what is going on. Some say Paul just left it out. Some say it doesn't matter. Some say there's no analogy. What was this seventh piece of armor? Let's look at it. It would have been number seven would be the lance or a spear. A lance or a spear. A Roman soldier had more than one lance or spear at his disposal. Like a sword, they changed and evolved over the centuries of the Roman Empire. Some were long and some were short. In ancient Rome, during the time of Homer and his writings, they would have primarily been made out of ash wood, and they would have had a metal apparatus on the end of it. The ash wood would have been six or seven feet tall. And then the iron, usually the metal would have been iron, that's on the end would have been shaped sometimes like a leaf or other times like a bulrush. Some were barbed and others were very ornate and some were very simple like a modern day spear that you might see. Undoubtedly, Paul, in all of his times in prison, looked over to that soldier that was guarding him and saw on the wall lots of different lances and spears. So why didn't he mention it? Well, Rick Renner in his book, Dressed to Kill, says he believes that he did. So let's read on and see if he did. Ephesians chapter 6 Verse 18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. The phrase there, all prayer, could literally be translated, and in many Bibles is, all kinds of prayer. So I believe, like Rick, that Paul is inferring a lance or a spear when he says, praying always with all kinds of prayer and supplication, or using all kinds of spears and lances, so to speak. Prayer is a vital part of the spiritual life of any believer. And I believe that it's a weapon that many Christians forget. See, like a lance or a, or a spear, prayer goes out before you. If that soldier would have had his, the, the, this lance or this spear he, and an enemy was coming, if he was good at it, if he was skilled at using it, he could throw that thing before him and hit the first one coming at him. So, you know, your prayers go out before you and can hit the enemy before he ever attacks you. Pray, you, you do not know how many times you would have died if your granny hadn't been praying for you. See, see, there's some of you that you were out living like the devil. Thank all three of you for admitting that. Come on now. And you were in all kinds of trouble, but you didn't know it. But before you were ever born, there might have been a great-great-grandmother. There might have been a great-great-granddaddy. There might have been somebody back in your family line that was praying for several generations to come. And what you didn't know, that long before you ever got there, they had sent a spear in the spirit that had hit the enemy and stopped his attack in your life. You don't
don't know how many times you were about to do something crazy. You were about to get hit by a train or a bus or you were about to pull out in front of somebody. You were about to commit suicide. You were about to pull out a knife and slit your wrist or do an overdose. And somebody in China was praying in the spirit for somebody in America that they did not even know and it saved your life. Yes, we do need to believe that. Just like there are many types of spears, there's many types of prayers. For one, there's individual prayer, and then there's corporate prayer. At Unhinged, we have, there's individual worship, there's corporate worship. We have, in, we have corporate worship at Unhinged and on Sunday mornings, but it's extended worship on the second Sunday of every month on Sunday night, we have unhinged and we have prayer time and that's where we can pray corporately. We have other corporate prayer times as well. At the bridge, we want every part of our army to know how to use their spear. Now, there's also, and I'm going to talk some more about some different types of prayer in just a minute, but but I want to stop for just a moment. If you need prayer, somebody to pray over you, or if you want to come together and pray with other believers, every Monday night we have a prayer team that meets at 7 p.m. in the auditorium, and they pray over the leadership team. They pray over all the ministries of the bridge. They pray over the bridge family. They pray over you, and you don't know it. They're praying over your life, and you're having miracles in your life, and you don't realize it, but it's because somebody comes and prays for you every Monday night at 7 p.m. Yeah. Now, if you need specific prayer, you ought to come because they'll pray over you for specific needs. If you want to come pray with other people for other people, then come and pray. If you don't know how to pray, come. They'll teach you how to pray. Because if you're going to use a weapon, you've got to learn how to use it. This would be a great place for you to dive in and learn how to give and receive prayer or pray for others on a regular basis. Now, time won't allow me to unpack all these, but just very quickly, let me give you a quick list of some different types or categories of prayer mentioned in the New Testament. I'm going to throw these out here at you. You can, get the, you can take notes or you can... Watch it online and take notes later uh, because I'm going to give them to you quickly because I don't have time to unpack them. And then we're going to finish up. Number one, all through the New Testament, there's seven categories. Here's the first one. Number one, the prayer of consecration. In Greek, this is prosyuche. It means face to face. It's the prayer that's used in Ephesians 6.18 when he says all prayer. Praying always with all kinds of prayer. That's this word, prosuke. First Timothy 2.1 gives a list of many different types. Most of these categories are listed in First Timothy 2.1. You can look that up on your own. It's used 127 times in the New Testament. This is intimacy with God. This is FaceTiming with the Father. You know God wants to FaceTime you and he don't even have an iPhone. You don't have to have an iPhone to do it. You don't even have to have any data. It's the most used probably because it's the most important but also the most undervalued. Every day you need FaceTime with the Father. Number two, prayer of petition. This is where in Ephesians 6.18 it says with all kinds of prayers and supplication. That's this word. Also used in 1 Timothy 2.1 in James 5.17. And in the Greek it's desis. And literally it means a need or a want. Actually very literally it means basic needs and basic desires. This is asking God for a need or desire for yourself or for others. Sadly, this is the only kind of prayer that most Christians pray. They don't have face time with daddy. They just have petition time with daddy. God wants you to ask him for things. Come on. But that's not all he wants to talk about. 
And that's all prayer is, is a conversation with God. How many of you are parents? If you're a parent, raise your hand. How many of you do not mind your kids asking you for some things? You want them, you want to know if they're hungry. When they're two, you want to know that they need to go to the bathroom. Please. You don't mind them asking for things. But if all they ever do is ask you for something, how many of you would after a while get tired of that? If the only conversation you ever have with your kids had to do with them asking you for things, after a while you would say, can we talk about something else? Why? Because you would feel like they're spoiled. Number three, a prayer of authority or the prayer of faith. It's in Hebrews 4, 16 is one example. This is using our delegated authority from heaven to decree and declare, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is praying with the authority of the believer. This is praying under God's delegated authority. And there are sometimes you don't need to ask for anything. You need to declare some stuff. When I pray for healing, I don't ask God to heal people. Because I can't ever find a time when Jesus did. I don't see Jesus asking God to heal anybody. What did Jesus do? He said, be healed. So by the authority invested in me by God and not the state of Texas, you got to declare some things. You got to decree some things. That's the prayer of authority or the prayer of faith. Number four, the prayer of thanksgiving. 1 Timothy 2, 1, 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. This is used 15 times. It's simply thanking God for all he has done, is doing, and all he's going to do. It's an acknowledgement in advance or in retrospect or in the midst of the situation that God is bigger than anything you're facing. Do you know it's impossible to complain and give thanks at the same time? So we, this is one of the categories of prayer. Listen, God doesn't need my thanks. God's not needy. He don't need my thanks. He's not sitting up there going, well, they just never said thank you for anything, and I'm offended. No, that's you. That ain't God. That's us. But I need to give thanks. So God doesn't need my thanksgiving, but I need to be a thankful person. Number five, prayer of supplication. The Greek word there is entuxis. It's a lighting upon, a meeting with another, a term used for a meeting with a king. It's Romans 11, 2 and 1 Timothy 2, 1 again and 1 Timothy 4, 5. It's only used five times and most of the time it's interpreted intercession. So it's to have a meeting with someone, especially of importance like a king, to make a request. It's a formal meeting with a formal request with an authority figure. Number six are prayers of intercession, which in the Greek is huper intenchano, which means to meet with an authority on the behalf of someone else or to rescue them. It's only used one time, and that's in Romans 8, 26. It's hooper and then entuchano. You put them together, and it's similar to the last one. That's why the last one is used as intercession, but this one is only on the behalf of others. It's, all, it's basically rescuing people, going before a king to ask for mercy on someone. This is the kind of prayer you pray over the lost. Come on, are you here? And then number seven is praying in the spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. Ephesians 6, 18 actually could read praying in the spirit with all kinds of prayer. Prayers and supplications. Praying in the Spirit bypasses your mind and prays the perfect will of God. So when you're praying in the Spirit, you could be doing any of these other six and not even know what you're doing. You could be praying in the Spirit and saving someone's life in Afghanistan. You could be praying in the Spirit and stopping the forces of evil from advancing in the earth. You could be praying in the spirit and be asking daddy for something you need. You could be praying in the spirit and just worshiping the father. So all of those can be there. When you have no clue what to pray, pray in the spirit. 
you have many, many weapons of prayer available. How many of you want to start praying more? Ariana, can you come? I'm landing this plane. Folks, it's time to armor up. Actually, the band can come with her quickly. And Danielle. It's time to armor up. Let me try that again. I said it's time to armor up. It's, it's time to put our armor on and keep our armor on. Give me a, give me the hand help. It's time to put our Turn this up just a little bit right here, David. Thank you. It's time to armor up and stay armored up. So I got a question for you. How many are ready to put on the whole armor of God? If you're ready to put on the whole armor of God, why don't you stand up? Why don't you stand to your feet? And, and, and say this after me. Are you up to repeat some things today? Come on, let's say some things together. Say, I'm putting on the whole armor of God. It makes me stronger than a superhero. I put on truth like a belt. Come on, say it like you mean it. I put on truth like a belt. His name is Jesus. And he's the foundation of all my armor. I have on the breastplate of righteousness. Not my righteousness, but his righteousness. It covers my heart and protects me. I wear peace like shoes. I carry peace wherever I go. I'm not looking for peace. I'm carrying peace. I have a shield of faith. And I take it up today. It's ready for battle. And I link my shield with other believers today. And every day. I'm not fighting against others. I'm fighting for others. My mind is covered with the helmet of salvation. My salvation is a beautiful thing. It's on display for all to see. And behold, the goodness of God. I live in a safe place in my mind. I use the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, with precision. God's Word in my mouth is a two-edged sword. It's a powerful weapon. And finally, I use all my spears a prayer, all that God has put at my disposal to defeat the enemy. I pick it up today and I will not lay it down. God has already won the war. I'm simply enforcing the victory. In Jesus' name, amen.